For more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hello everyone and welcome to a new issue of People's Health Dispatch, the health publication by People's Dispatch and People's Health Movement, dedicated to the struggles in health and struggles of health workers. Recently, governments from around the world met at the WHO and agreed to move ahead with plans for a new binding treaty to address future pandemics. Countries will now meet over the next two years to decide the details of this treaty. Right now, we're still very much in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, for which the global response has been extremely inadequate. In this discussion, we're going to reflect on the utility of a binding treaty at this time and the global dynamics that we're seeing playing out in these discussions. Here today with me, I have Priti Patnaik, who is the founding editor of Geneva Health Files. Priti, thank you so much for giving your time and, and being here with us. So I wanted to start off by asking you to just outline for us what is the pandemic treaty, why are we discussing it, and who has been driving it? Uh, thanks so much for the um, invite, and I'm happy to um, um, be a part of this conversation also based on, on um, our uh, recent reporting on, on these issues. Um, so essentially, um, the 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 term pandemic treaty um, has become a shorthand for something wider, which is that uh, there is expectation that WHO member states um, feel the need to come up with new rules to govern health emergencies. Um, and there are uh, a bunch of different motivations uh, of who's uh, driving this conversation and, and uh, where we are today, um, this week we saw that um, WHO member states adopted a decision to actually um, start negotiations for new rules to govern uh, uh, health emergencies. Um, given the kind of uh, you know, inequities we have faced, uh, not just in the access of vaccines, but also other medical products, um, disruption in supply chains and so on and so forth, I think uh, uh, many different uh, sectors of society feel the need uh, to not lose the momentum and, and use this crisis to actually um, redraw uh, how some of these existing rules function. Um, and now it is clear that you know, we need something more than what we already have. Um, so I think um, the genesis of the idea that we should have some kind of a international agreement to govern health emergencies um, was, was first, uh, let's say, uh, incubated uh, um, in, in the West, uh, particularly um, uh, the European Union. Uh, and over time, um, this, this happened sometime uh, you know, in late uh, 2020. Um, and earlier this year, um, about uh, 25 to 30 countries came together and started you know, talking about, uh, you know, formalizing the conversation around the pandemic treaty. Um, and earlier in the year, um, at the World Health Assembly in May, uh, member states agreed to actually set up um, a working group that will work on uh, WHO strengthening and um, uh, preparedness uh, and response to health emergencies. Um, and one of the tasks uh, of this working group actually was, was to also um, prioritize uh, and assess the need for a, for a new instrument. Um, so that's where we are. Um, and, and, and following the May Assembly, it was also decided that a special session of the World Health Assembly should be convened in November. Uh, this was uh, convened this, uh, this month, uh, this week, and, um, and where it was decided that, yes, uh, there is a need to, to uh, launch negotiations for, for new rules. Um, the, the, the thing you must keep in mind is that between, uh, during the summer, between August and November, a lot of progress was made by countries. Uh, there were a lot of uh, divergences between countries, but they arrived at um, a somewhat difficult consensus that, that this is the way, this is the way to go. Um, uh, having, having said that, um, 
I will, I will, you know, it is still too early to conclude uh, the shape and the form that any new rules that's going to come up will will take. Um, I think I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Um, so then, moving on, so you've mentioned about the the meeting that we saw happened this week. Uh, member states, governments came together and made this decision to move forward on the treaty. Um, I'm wondering, could you just outline a bit more for us, and you've already mentioned the decision, but sort of what happened at this meeting and whether there was any particular moments or um, particular interventions or things that happened over this week that you think are worth highlighting? Um, yeah, I think this week uh, was a reflection of all the discussions and dynamics that we witnessed over the last uh, uh, few months and weeks. Um, so like I mentioned um, earlier, um, initially, there were only about 25, 30 countries, uh, you know, that were, let's say, early endorsers for the idea of a, of a treaty or an agreement. Um, eventually, as the, you know, weeks and months passed, uh, the decision that was adopted by, by the World Health Assembly this week was, was endorsed. Um, uh, the decision text was endorsed by more than 100 countries. And eventually, of course, uh, all the 194 member states of WHO adopted the decision. So, so all member states stand by this decision as it were. Um, so some of the you know, uh, dynamics that we witnessed um, was um, over the last few months leading up to this week was uh, you know, these were highly, highly contentious and highly political discussions. Um, and there was a lot of unease among um, uh, not only many developing countries who had yet to sort of formulate national positions on these issues because they're busy fighting the pandemic, um, but also uh, other developed countries who were, um, you know, some of whom were not comfortable with signing, uh, with already committing to binding nature of these rules and so on. Um, ha having said that, um, I think uh, there were a lot of discussions on equity, on, 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 on the strength of existing rules. Do we actually new, need new rules or do we, you know, or can we rework existing rules? So all those dynamics came to the fore even at the World Health Assembly. And what was, um, you know, a couple of things uh, were striking. One is that, um, as we reported earlier as well, that a lot of developing countries um, are interested in taking this conversation forward, in committing to these negotiations, because they truly believe that uh, these negotiations are a unique opportunity to address uh, concerns on on equity. Uh, they they see that um, any new rules will have to have uh, binding commitments on equity, uh, whether it's access to medicines, intellectual property issues, um, you know, addressing long-standing issues in research and development, uh, and a whole host of other issues related to equity. Um, and I think. Um, Country after country um, at the World Health Assembly this week, uh, you know, presented equity as a central central goal and motivation for for um, their involvement and commitment to these negotiations. So that was striking. Um, and what also sort of came to the fore um, um, is the importance of existing rules. And these, you know, there are a, a range of rules that actually uh, govern health emergencies. Among them, central to this process are international health regulations. Um, and in the lead up to these discussions, um, countries were divided um, over whether they must strengthen these existing rules um, or whether they need, uh, you know, they need a, a completely new approach. And it appeared to me that um, uh, for a number of countries, uh, the international health regulations or the IHRs as they are called, uh, you know, they, they, are, they continue to be important, you know, from, from Brazil, um, uh, China, um, and, and many others who, who sort of made statements uh, that uh, there has to be a, coherent, a coherence and, you know, and there has to be a complementarity in the process of how we address these, um, these, these you know, different approaches um, to, to tackle health emergencies in the future. Um, I think um, although there was a lot of uh, heat and dust on, on uh, the specific legal routes that, uh, that new rules should take, uh, but, but frankly, um, uh, there was some mention, some countries did mention that we must take a particular route uh, you know, on, on how these rules should be framed, uh, but, but not so many. And this actually also goes to show that uh, you know, some of these discussions are, are um, sort of uh, premature, something that some countries were were um, insisting on 
um, meaning that let's talk about what these rules should be uh, and not so much about how they should be framed and you know the specific instruments that should be used and so on. Um, um, I think um, I think overall um, this is a this is a very significant moment um, and um, as as the decision stands now there is still a lot of latitude for for countries to actually um, uh, you know draft these new rules according to to their own needs and and as, as I told you these needs are very diverse the motivations of different uh, countries are very different. Uh, for developing countries, equity is a major issue. For some of the countries in the north, um, you know, they they um, they they want uh, to see new rules on sharing information on pathogens, for example, just to give you an example. And um, also, you must understand that um, the special the special session of the assembly is you know took place in the backdrop of a new variant and and in the midst of a raft of new travel restrictions uh, for affected countries um, that also contributed to the you know overall uh, overall um, climate at these discussions uh, and some southern countries also suggested that maybe we should have binding um, uh, commitments uh, on addressing unfair travel restrictions for example um, so these were some of the you know uh, elements that came up repeatedly during this week Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, and I wanted to focus particularly on the sort of elements that you raised, for example, about several countries highlighted the need for stronger equity. Um, and I was just wondering then, how can we make that a reality in terms of how can we go forward? What sort of things do we see? Do we need to see? What sort of commitments do we need to see? to try and make these themes become um, a reality moving forward, that both perhaps in the way that discussions are being had and in terms of what commitments do we want from countries? Um, right, I think that this is going to be, uh, you know, the, the million dollar question as it were. And, and um, the way I see it is that this is an opportunity and maybe it's going to be the ultimate fight to actually uh, code norms on, on, on equity. And it's going to be um, very difficult because of uh, uh, the kind of entrenched interest uh, that we have seen, which has resulted in the inequities that we are witnessing today. Um, I, I think before answering your question on equity, you have to just take a step back on, on the motivations for, for these new rules. Um, and I, as I mentioned uh, earlier, I think uh, you know developed countries have certain expectations of these new rules. You have the industry uh, as you know civil society organizations and other scholars that have a certain expectations of these rules and then of course we, we already discussed that equity is central to to uh, to all developing countries um you have to keep that in uh, mind that uh, we we have a whole diverse group of actors uh, wanting a treaty but a treaty that will address uh, you know different concerns as it were um a number of proposals on equity have been discussed and have been put forward um, by, by different countries, but notably uh, South Africa that actually proposed that, you know, equity is something that has to be seen across the board. Not, we're not just about, about vaccines, but about, um, you know, access to treatments, uh, access to uh, diagnostics um, and equity in the way we think about tra trade and travel measures in the way we share information and the benefits that arise from uh, sharing this information. Um, so I think that um, there are a number of um, uh, sort of um, concomitant uh, legal regimes that already determine various aspects of equity, but the expectation is that one new uh, international agreement on future health emergencies will govern uh, you know, across all of these components, and that hasn't really happened before. So, to that extent, it's a significant and a real opportunity, and and therefore this is being seen as a legitimate moment, as it were. Um, for for um, for some of the um, you know uh, civil society organizations and the and the very strong and influential access to medicines movement, for instance, sees this that this is the moment to create norms um, on access. Um, you know, have rules on financing and licensing of R&D, uh, on technology transfer, on regulatory standards, uh, on governance and transparency, so on and so forth. Um, so I think, um, you know, th there are a lot of these blue sky approaches as to what, what will be um, uh, addressed under the overarching 
theme of equity, but it really depends uh, what kind of deep concessions are some of the players willing to make. Um, you know, um, whether, whether countries in the North um, are willing to actually um, consider, uh, you know, very deep-seated um, uh, beliefs about, let's say, protection of intellectual property. And we, we see this fight currently um, sort of unraveling at the, at the World Trade Organization in the context of the TRIPS waiver. So there are some indications on how difficult this uh, fight, uh, you know, to ensure provisions and equity could be. Um, so, so having said that, um, I, I, I think um, at, at, the, at the end of this week, um, I, I believe that um, uh, this, this is the moment for optimism for, for, for many countries. Um, and we, we, we do hope that developing countries will actually be able to uh, use all the right bargaining chips, as it were, to ensure that their interests are, are actually uh, eventually addressed um, and, and um, you know, are made legally binding, as it were, for, for, uh, for the industry, for, for other countries and so on. Thank you. Um, I'm sort of re re reaching to an end, so I wonder if you had any final remarks or any final thoughts or perhaps particular global dynamics that we, we all need to be kept aware of um, and to be really lucid about the linkages between certain dynamics and the processes that we're going to see in sort of the discussions. And um, you already mentioned sort of about these deep seated um, ideologies certain countries have around intellectual property restrictions, for example. Um, and I know you spoke earlier on about, about how it's particularly in the EU who are pushing the need for a treaty. Um, and now we're having the convergence around this from different countries. So um, I was wondering around in that general topic, is anything that you'd, you'd like to share as we draw to a close? Sure. Um, I think um, it is um, it is important it is important to recognize uh, uh, the legitimate need um, of of developing countries um, um, that they they do they do feel that this is the moment of opportunity for them. Um, but but having said that, um, you know what the last few months have shown is that uh, in all of these discussions, there is a perception there is a perception that there is a kind of a forced multilateralism um, and, and there was a perception that, um, you know, this is like, this was like a straight jacketed consensus on, on like, this is the way we have to go forward. Um, um, despite the fact that, you know, many, many countries, especially developing countries with smaller delegations, find it very hard to negotiate, um, you know, rules um, and treaties across different uh, platforms and now we will see um, a number of different parallel uh, discussions and negotiations happening. We have to keep in mind that there are uh, very serious capacity issues, especially for smaller delegations, um, and these are very, uh, very contentious and 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 difficult uh, negotiations um, going forward. We can expect them to be really difficult, and and the fact that um, many of the countries are still fighting the pandemic um, and may not have the kind of um, um, capacities and resources to really ensure that their interests will be protected. I think this is something that must be uh, kept in mind. There is a very real risk that um, if, um, you know, if, if it, it's quite possible that they might end up um, committing more than, more than um, they should, as far as protecting their own interests is concerned, as far as developing countries go, um, and I think that um, we, this is something we 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 have to we have to keep in mind. Uh, but this is how it is. It it has been it has been uh, um, you know uh, a, a playing field that is not that is not level. And I think uh, that the pandemic actually exacerbates these um, inequalities, even in decision making and the kind of. Uh, uh, latitude that that member states have at the international level. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Priti. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, yeah, I think it's very clear from the discussions and what you shared with us today that there's a lot to reflect on what we've seen in the negotiations and the drivers of it so far, and which are the dynamics that are, of course, going to persist as they do in the whole sort of global health governance and international society. So I think you've highlighted some really key points that we can all sort of keep in mind as we continue to watch these negotiations. 
Um, yeah, so thank you so much. Thanks a lot.